Thank everybody for coming and uh, covering Penn State football. I'm going to keep it brief because I know you guys got a bunch of questions. Um, but uh, obviously, want to start by giving Nebraska credit. Um, you know, I think the story of the game uh, was was turnovers in the first half. That's been a similar challenge that we have had, um, you know, this year. Uh, the turnovers early in games. You know, you think about, you know, one interception uh, that's returned. I think down to the 15 yard line, uh, as well as a fumble recovery for a touchdown. Uh, you know, two weeks in a row. So that's. That's been the thing that w more than anything in my mind that, that we have got to get cleaned up um, and got to get that resolved, not only on offense in protecting the football, but on defense in terms of uh, creating turnovers. I was watching last night um, you know, the, from early in the year, I think it was the Northwestern and Iowa game. And I think in that game, uh, I think you know, Northwestern had three turnovers and Iowa had four. Um, so I think that's the biggest, biggest story. I thought we battled like crazy in the second half. We won the second half 17 to three. Uh, defense gave up three points and 95 yards total in the second half. Our field goal execution was good, but obviously we need to score more touchdowns and not, and not field goals. Uh, we got to punt the ball. We got to punt the ball better. You know, that's something that from a field position standpoint, uh, that we haven't been able to do consistently uh, this year, and that's going to be important, especially against this Iowa football team that's that's really good uh, in the return units. So, you know, that's uh, that's kind of a, a quick summary of of Nebraska. Uh, and then, obviously, the last thing on Nebraska is obviously you know Will Levis came in and, and did some good things and, and gave us a spark. Um, you know, when you get into Iowa, you know we've been fortunate to have some great games. Uh, since I got here, uh, six games against against this program, um, and they've been they've been great games, and we've been fortunate uh, to find ways to get wins, all different types of ways to get wins. Uh, obviously, Kirk Ferentz is the uh, he's the uh, the vet uh, in the Big Ten, been the head coach at, at Iowa for 22 years. Um, obviously, you know, they do a great job. They play hard, they play sound, they play fundamental football. You know, typically they've been built up front with their front seven uh, on, on, uh, on defense and their offensive line and tight ends on offense. But on that same note, I think uh, since 2017, I think they've led the country in interceptions. So that will be a, that will be a challenge for us. Um, but I got a lot of respect for, for Coach Ferentz and the Iowa football program. Like I said in the beginning, we've been fortunate um, to, have, to have a pretty good amount of success over the last six years, um, which, which was probably uh, somewhat different than uh, how it was the, the few years before we got here. Um, and, and obviously, we got to do everything we possibly can to find a way uh, to get a win on Saturday, which would be really important for our program, be really important for most importantly our players and coaches and our, and our fans and community. So uh, it's going to be a tremendous challenge, but looking forward to the opportunity. So open it up to questions. Okay. Sorry. We'll start with Mark Brennan, Fight on State. Rich Scarcelli, you're on deck. Hey, James, thanks for taking the time today. You too, Mark. Hey, uh, have you settled on a starting quarterback? If so, can you tell us who it is and how you came to the decision? And if not, can you take us through the timetable of how you'll figure that out this week? Yeah, um, you know, obviously I knew that that question was coming, and, and I get it. Um, yeah, we, we have not, um, we have not, you know, made made that decision or announced that decision yet. Um, obviously, we had some conversations about it about it this weekend. Uh, with not only the coaching staff, um, but also uh, you know with uh, Sean and with with Will as well, uh, based on what we're going to do in practice this week and things like that. So um, <clears throat> you know we'll we'll evaluate that as the week goes on, based on uh, you know what we do this week, but also what we've done this season and and what we've done last year. Uh, obviously, Will um, you know came in and did did some good things and and put himself in, in this position, and, and he's earned it. Um, no different than Sean had, had earned the ability to be our, our starting quarterback last year and our starting quarterback to start the season. 
um, you know, Will was able to come in and, and, and earn to be a uh, part of this conversation. So, um, but no, I, Mark, it's not like we have decided um, or, or made any announcements yet. And as you guys know, and I know it drives you crazy sometimes, um, you know, we, we typically <clears throat> aren't going to make any announcements publicly unless it's obvious for some type of season ending injury or things like that. We, we don't do, some people don't even do depth charts now. Teams we play don't even do depth charts at, at all. Um, you know, we, we try to, we try to give you guys, you know, a little bit of information, but, but, but not, uh, not everything all at once. Rich Scarcella, Reading Eagle, Parth, you're on deck. Hi, James. Thanks Hi, for Rich. your time. You too. Um, James, what do you think that your defense has to do better, especially in the first half of games? Well, I, I think it's a couple things, Rich. Um, we have typically really over six years haven't always been open, haven't always been great in opening drives. That's, that's, that's been a, a fairly consistent theme and, and things that we have talked about, uh, myself and Coach Pry and, and the defensive staff. Uh, obviously, you know, people typically script. That's usually, you know, um, you're going to get a scripted set of plays and formations to kind of find out what you're going to be in and are you playing how they expect. Um, but that's something we've, we've discussed, not just for this year, but for a number of years. But typically, you know, we've been able to settle down. I, I think one of the challenges is, is obviously we got to tackle better um, and, and we got to be able to, to adjust faster. Uh, but the other thing is, is a lot of the turnovers, Rich, have happened in the, in the first half. You know, when you have two turnovers for touchdowns and then you have turnovers for big returns where one goes for a touchdown and one drive starts at the 15-yard line, you know, that's challenging as well. Um, so, you know, we, we got we to gotta find a way to play better in opening drives. Uh, we got to protect the ball on offense, and we got to play our brand that we've been playing on defense in the second halves earlier in games. But I think more than anything, it's 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 tackling, um, and it's being able to adjust to all the different looks that we're getting early in games, um, and being able to understand there's going to be some things that show up in games that it's the first time that you're seeing it. And you have to trust your training and fall into your empty rules or fall into your unbalanced rules or whatever they are for that week because you just can't cover everything in a week, especially uh, in opening drives. Parthu Padye, Center Daily Times. Audrey Snyder, you're on deck. Coach, appreciate the time this afternoon. Thank you. You too, Parth. When we first spoke to you after the, the season opening game against Indiana, you know, when Noah Kane went down, you kind of mentioned that Devin Ford would have to grow into being that guy. And there was a big difference between obviously being, you know, a complimentary piece and the lead dog. Um, through these last three plus weeks since then, how have you seen Devin kind of take on that responsibility? Yeah, I thought last week Devin and the two young backs, um, Kevon and Kaziah, uh, really did some good things. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Devin is carrying most of the load, and those other guys are, are able to give him a blow um, and are doing some nice things as well. But, yeah, I see Devin growing. I thought we ran the ball last week as, as good as we've run it this year, and that's a combination of the offensive line and tight ends um, as well as the running backs. I know, uh, I know Coach Sider, when we review uh, our notes on Sunday after we've all watched it, uh, multiple times, um, I know he was he was pleased with the running backs, not just how they ran the ball, but also how they protected. Uh, I thought they did a good job in, in pass protection as well. So that group is coming along, and, and we need them we need them to continue to come along. This is going to be a week. Uh, it's always challenging to run the ball against Iowa. You know they're big and they're physical in the front seven, and you got to be able to break tackles. And again, you watch that Northwestern game and. You know, it wasn't always pretty, but it was three, four yards, one yard, three yards, you know, um, 16 play drives. Um, you know, um, when you watch it, maybe it didn't feel like they were being overly successful. But I think in that game, I think they may have only thrown it five times in the first half. Um, you know, but that's kind of how you have to be against Iowa. They're, they're going to make you earn it. Um, and, and we're going to have to be ready for a physical football game. Audrey Snyder, The Athletic. Greg Pickle, you're on deck. Good afternoon, James. Hey, Audrey. Um, 
after having a chance to watch Will in that game, uh, what are some of the things you think he did well? What are some areas you'd like to see him grow and develop in? Well, I think I think Will's got a really strong arm and can drive the ball and, and make defenses defend the entire 53 and a third of the field, which which is helpful. His arm strength is also, I think, going to uh, help um, with with yards after the catch. I think you know that that showed up on, on Saturday, and and how this plays out, you know, could moving forward. Um, I think one of the areas that he would admit that he needs to get a little bit better on is is some of his touch. Uh, you know, when to take a little bit of the octane off the pass um, and put it in a position where our guy has a chance to go up and and make the play and. You know, that's kind of all the little subtle things of playing the quarterback position. Everybody loves the, the big, strong arm, which, which he has. Um, but it's also, you know, uh, knowing when to take a little something off it and, and throw for touch. And then I think the other thing that he did well on Saturday, obviously he's a big physical runner. We saw it last year against Ohio State. Uh, not only is he able to make people miss, but he tends to fall forward on runs and um, you know, a couple of the runs, even on short yardage, where you know he got hit, you know, you know, even sometimes in the backfield, and was able to you know carry a guy for a yard to to get the first down and to keep the drive al alive. So uh, he played hard and and he played with passion and and uh, and, and did some good things. Uh, we just we just got to make a few more throws and and and, and again continue to continue to improve in, in some of the tat uh, the touch aspects of the game. Greg Pickle, Penn Live. Elton, you're on deck. Good afternoon, Coach. Thanks for your time. You too, Greg. Curious what the film told you about the way your line performed once Caden Wallace came in and Will Fry kicked in the guard, and if you saw enough from that to make that your starting group moving forward. Yeah, again, as you know, you know I won't announce uh, starters at this time, but, yeah, we thought Caden uh, did, some, did some good things. I mean, obviously that's why – um, you know, we got him in there for, for that many reps because he just continues to gain confidence. He is big and strong and powerful and, and light on his feet. Um, I also think having Will Fries at guard, I think, also helps Caden because he's got an older, experienced guy right next to him who's played a lot of football for him. Um, so that's been, that's been helpful, that combination. We've also been able to rotate some other guys in there, Juice Scruggs and CJ and Miranda. Um, you know, so I think that's that's been a positive for us. Um, so, you know, I could see that that continue to grow. Um, you know, as long as he continues to develop the way we think he will. Elton Hayes, CNHI Pennsylvania. Donnie Collins, you're on deck. Hey, Coach. Hope you're having a good afternoon. Hey, Elton. You too. Coach, earlier, um, I think it was back in September when we spoke about the grind of playing nine games consecutively and um, not having that bye week. One of the benefits you mentioned was being able to rotate some guys in without having to burn, um, you know, a red shirt this season. How it's wanted to know, you know, four games into the season, how that's benefited you so far and what are some things that you, um, you know, how have you been able to use that to your advantage? Yeah, you know, obviously – Typically, early in the season, out of conference games and things like that, you can you can gain experience, uh, or you're playing well and you're able to get up by a few points and able to get some guys in the game that you want to be able to get reps. Uh, but all the games have been such battles that you know it's hard to take your starters off the field um, and rotate some guys in. We've done that at some positions and we've done that in some places out of necessity. Uh, whether a guy hasn't been available because of injuries or, or whatever it may be, but but yeah, it's 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 been a grind. You know, there, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, this, this 2020, I, I, I see things you know every day um, and every week uh, all across the NFL, all across college football. Um, you know, I'm looking at the records in the Big Ten. I'm looking at the, you know, the top 25 rankings. You know, I don't know if I've, I, I've seen a year like this in the Big Ten, um, you know, since I've been here. Um, obviously, specific to Penn State, uh, specifically. Donnie Collins, Times Tribune. Neil Rudell, you're on deck. Hi, James. Appreciate you doing you, this. You too, Donnie. Um, the defense only allows six points once after Will came in the game. And then, and then afterwards, a couple of the guys kind of talked about the spark he, he provided for them on that side of the ball. And, I, and I'm wondering, is, is there, do you think that's a, a coincidence? Is that something that could be, yeah, is that something that could be continued if, if, if he's the, if he's the starter? And is, is there, 
is there something about the way he plays that might promote the defense, you know, kind of you know, ha- having that, you know, be able to have that kind of aggressive style moving forward in games? Yeah, I think, I think the, the reality is, um, you know, you'd love for the, the defense and the offense and special teams to go do their jobs um, no matter what, you know, the, the circumstances may be. But the, the reality is when the defense makes a play, it, it, it has an effect on the offense. When the offense makes a play, it has an effect on the defense, and special teams is, is the same way. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily something specific about, um, about Will, but he came in and, and, and did some nice things, you know, and um, obviously that has an impact uh, on our entire team. You know, anybody, you know, and, and we've, we've been able to do that over six years is make big plays, you know, um, you know, and, ma- and make big plays to swing momentum. Even sometimes when people make a big play against us, we've been able to counter with a big play as well to swing momentum and emotion on the sideline and, and in the stadium. So, uh, you know, Will did some good things on Saturday and, and gave us a chance to, to go win the game. Uh, our defense was able to get a late turnover as well. Um, so yeah, I, 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 think, I think your point uh, is a good one. Um, and, I, and I do understand that you know, when the defense you know, plays well, it, it, it definitely has an impact on the offense and vice versa. And, and you know, obviously Will was a part of that in the second half on Saturday. And you know, we'll, we'll see how this plays out this week and, 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 and we can build on it. Neil Rodell, El Mirror, Mike Gross, you're on deck. Hey, James. Hey, uh, Neil. J- wondering, um, uncharted territory uh, for a lot of people. Uh, you've not been in this situation. You know, who do you lean on? Who coaches you, uh, you know, during uh, these kind of struggles? It's a good question, Neil. I actually almost called you this, this afternoon. Um, <laughs> You know, obviously, not, with you know, with you know, my family not being here, and and um, you know, uh, that's you know, that's that's a that's a good question. You know, Neil. You know, I have people that I call uh, and people that reach out to me. I've had a, a bunch of people reach out to me. You know, which is which is nice. Um, but you know, I, I'm trying to be there for the players. I'm trying to be there for the coaching staff and to help us navigate through these times that none of us have been through before, ever. Um, and that is specific to football, um, but that also is you know, family issues, that's COVID issues, that is uh, academic issues, um, that's normal growing pains of 18 to 22 year old you know, young men. Uh, it's, it's all of it. And, and, you know, that's, that's my job and my responsibility as the head coach is to support everybody um, and, and, and give direction and, and give a path and, and get people excited and motivated during a time when it's, it's, that's challenging to do, you know. But um, I, also, I also try to remind myself every single day, uh, you know, how blessed I am and, and how fortunate I am. You know, I think about, you know, uh, you know, what Journey Brown has gone through this year. Um, you know, I think about, um, you know, the fact that I got two healthy daughters and, and my wife and, and, and the staff and, and all those types of things. So, um, you know, what we are being tested right now and, and we are being challenged. And, uh, you know, we plan to, you know, we plan to answer the test and we plan to uh, uh, grow from this. You know, it doesn't always feel like it at the time, Neil. Um, and that's why I almost called you this afternoon. But, um, you know, but I, I believe good will come from this uh, for, for my program, you know, for our players, uh, for myself. It doesn't feel, feel it at the time. Um, but, but I'm going to use this as an opportunity to get better and grow. Mike Gross, LNP News. Joe Giuliano, you're on deck. Uh, good afternoon, James. How are you? You too, Mike. Um, over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of uh, analysis of kind of the mental and emotional makeup of the team it, from us, from the fans, uh, even from the players. And when we've talked to them after the game, what, what do you think about the sort of personality of this team? Is there anything about this group? I realize I'm asking you to generalize about 100 human beings, but but is there anything about this group that 
that that kind of sets them apart. What's your take on the personality of this group? Well, I, I think the, the thing that's hard to do right now, Mike, is to, is to separate it all. I think I think you got to look at all of the circumstances. You got to look at our team. You got to look at our coaching staff. Uh, you got to look at you know what the off season was like. You got to look at uh, the internal challenges that we've had. You got to look at the external challenges we've had. You got to look at things specific to Pennsylvania, specific to Penn State. Um, you know, all of it, uh, all of it. Um, it, it all factors in. Uh, all the positive things have an impact, and, and all the negative things have an impact. But the reality is, it is what it is. And I know people turn on their TVs on Saturday afternoon. And they want to be able to have an escape away from their lives and enjoy uh, Nittany Lion football and, and Penn State football. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we have a responsibility to, to go out there and play well. Um, but, but, yeah, when, when you got 18 to 22-year-old men and you got a, 100 of them and, and a staff and, um, you know, all the things and all the challenges that, that, that I see – in the NFL and that I see across college football right now. Um, you know, I think of all the stuff with, with COVID, you know, um, all the changes uh, in our program, all the things that, that we're doing. You know, one of the, one of the issues that we, we continue to have issues with um, is, is false positives. Um, you know, we've had 39 false positives where that means 39 people missing practice. And we're, we're at, I think, a higher rate than, than anybody in the conference and trying to find out why. Because every time we have one of those guys, uh, they, they miss a practice. Um, so, you know, I, I will say that, again, there's a silver lining and everything. And the positive is, knock on wood, um, you know, those are, not, those are not positive COVID tests, which is something we've worked really hard to keep everybody as, as safe and healthy as we possibly can. But I guess what I'm saying, Mike, is it's, is this – it's just hard right now to do that because it's just been so many, many things going on. I will, I will, I will say that from, from what I've seen, uh, this team cares deeply about one another. Uh, this team battles, uh, you know, for four quarters. We showed that last week and gave our ch gave, gave ourselves a chance to win at the end. Um, you know, but but everybody's trying to navigate this, and and there's not too many of us that, that have been through this before, specifically at this level. Joe Giuliano, Philadelphia Inquirer, New Bias, you're on deck. Uh, hello, James. Hey, Joe. Um, after your film study of Saturday's game, what did you feel were the biggest problems in the red zone? Uh, what would you have to do to rectify those problems? And was being a second teamer coming into the game was Will prepared enough to handle the the all those red sign red zone responsibilities yeah so good good question um you know i think a, a couple of things i think you know when you get into the red zone um everything is magnified the details are all magnified because all the windows shrink um you know uh there's just less space for the defense to cover they don't have to defend any vertical routes it's all horizontal and high lows um so Excuse me. So all the details get magnified down there, and precision, you know, is, is critical. Um, you know, and I also think that's where the touch comes in. You know, the touch comes in of rather than driving the ball across the field, um, it's it's dropping the ball into certain zones and certain areas and, and things like that. So uh, there's no doubt that that we have to improve there. Um, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the days of field goals in, in college football, don't get me wrong, they're important, but, but you got to be able to score points and you got to be able to score touchdowns, uh, if you win, if you want to win at a high level early on in the season, I, Joe, I thought it was, you know, we weren't running the ball effectively enough. I thought we ran the ball better on Saturday, but, but you got to be able to do both, both. You got to be able to run the ball, uh, and you got to be able to, uh, threaten people and stretch people. Uh, and challenge people in red zone combinations, and then and then be able to touch, you know, be able to either drive the ball or drop the ball into tight windows. New bias, Will Warren, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. T. Frank, you're on deck. Coach, I was going to ask you a football question, but your answer to Mike kind of made me think. Um, how tough is it? Because you guys did play a game against Maryland. They had a little mini outbreak. Then you 
you said you've had 39 false positives. Like, how does that affect the kid when he gets a false positive or he thinks he has it, considering everything going on and the cases going up in PA and really all across the country? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> we, we've, had, we've had a few kids as well as staff members that have gotten false positives multiple days in a row. So it's, it's test positive, get put in isolation, retest. You know, the test comes back negative you know, later in the day, typically, typically about halfway through practice because uh, the way we're set up here in, in State College, our, our retesting um, is about an hour and 45 minutes away. So we have to drive it an hour and 45 minutes away, get a test, wait for the test results, and then, and then, and then bring them back. Um, you know, where obviously depending on, you know, where your school is located and the town and the city and things like that, there's just everybody's got different, you know, circumstances and challenges to, to deal with. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it can be an emotional roller coaster, um, you know, throughout the week. Um, you got staff members, you know, um, you know, that are going through it. And then other guys, GAs or analysts have to jump into that role for practice that day. Um, you know, I, I do know talking to one of our uh, coaches, uh, another school that he used to work at, um, I think was down six, six coaches one day, you know, in a practice. Um, so, again, you know, this, this, is, this is what 2020 has brought us. And, um, you know, we got to find a way to navigate it the best we can. Uh, but it's not a level playing field across college football. It's, it's, it's not the same. Um, uh, some places are, are, are better. Some places are worse. Some, some places have more resources. Some places have more challenges. Um, you know, it, it really depends. But at the end of the day, you got to navigate it the best you can, and you got to find a way to be successful. And, and that's what we're battling every single day to do. T. Frank, ESPN Radio 1450. Ben Jones, you're on deck. Hey, James. Good to speak with you today. You too, T. Frank. A uh, question about your defense. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but how would you evaluate your defense's ability to diagnose what they see post-snap? And in general, how do you coach aggressiveness without falling for offensive deception? Yeah, so I, I think I think the first thing is, is a good one. Um, you know, we... We have some veteran players that have played a lot of football, and we got some we got some guys that have not played a whole lot of football or in starting roles for the first time. And when obviously when they are seeing things for the first time, um, you know obviously you, you typically don't process it as fast as someone that's seen it before. Um, you know even even four games in, you know we're we're still working through some of that. Um, so that's that's part of it. Um, and then I think the other thing you said was about possessions. You said, uh, Chris, do you remember what? I do not. Can you unmute? Yeah, how do you coach aggressiveness without um, coaching, without uh, falling for offensive deception? Oh, deception. deception. That's what you said. Okay, excuse me. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that, that's, the, that's the fine line, and that's where, you know, the details of the film study that's where the details of, of, of coaching matter uh, in terms of the angles you take. And then I also think, you know, understanding situational football, you know, where, where are those double moves going to show up? Where are those uh, decep decep uh, deception type plays? Where, where are they going to show up? Um, and part of it is instincts, in instincts of a player, you know, of, of being able to tell the difference, the subtle differences between. Uh, a you know a, a hitch route and a double move or an out and an out and up because there are subtle differences. Um, so and I think typically you know those those come with experience. You know th those come with experience. So um, you know but it but it's all of it. It's it's the film study. It's the details. It's it's the instincts. It's situational football. Um, you know it's it's all of it. It's also knowing you know your opponent and knowing the play caller. Um, you know, as a defensive coordinator, some of the things that you can call in those situations to reduce some of that risk based on, you know, when this coordinator typically likes to take shots. It's, it's, it's all those things. Ben Jones, statecollege.com. Peter Terpster, you're on deck. Hey, James, how's it going? Good, Ben, you? 
Um, no complaints. Um, how do you balance between developing into the team that you want to be and embracing the team that you might have to be this year? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you have to do whatever you have to do to give your team the best chance to win and, and whatever that may look like. And that's based on your personnel. Um, and that's based on the experience of your staff and their background and the things that they do well and the players do well. Um, and, and playing a style of football that's going to give you the best chance to do that without becoming too conservative and without becoming too predictable. And that's, that's the fine line. Um, and I think, I think that's some of what you have seen in, in second halves of, of changing our style of play um, to solve some of the issues that we've had in first halves. But I think to your point, you know, uh, we may have to go into some of the games uh, with, a, with a similar mentality um, uh, to give us the best chance to, to be successful. Peter Terpstra, WTAJ. John Stroh, you're on deck. Hey, Coach. Um, I'm hey, not Peter. talking about COVID positives, uh, but what are the first steps in keeping your team positive or upbeat do you spend any extra time maybe on the, the things you guys did good on film um, or, or just to kind of avoid, um, you know, the negativity of knowing for a start? Yeah, I, th I think you do. I think you have to, you have to balance that always. Um, and the reality is, you know, after wins, a lot of times you can be harder on guys, you know, and, uh, you know, we've talked about that, you know, for six years, you know, um, that even when you win, the, there's still things that need to get corrected and cleaned up to allow you to continue to win. Uh, and after losses, you got to make the corrections, uh, but you got to do it in a way uh, that 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 young man can hear it at the time and is, and is going to grow and, and and not be defensive. Um, and that's all of us. You know that that that's all of us. I think that's I think that's really important. And I'd say it's it's probably more challenging. Uh, than it's ever been you know I think I think social media plays a part in that it's really hard as the head coach uh, to insulate the players uh, you know from from a lot of the noise out there um, I think the other thing that's that's made it challenging is is our playoff system um, you know there's a there's a mentality in a sense it's it's you're in the playoffs and playing for a national championship or you're not and, um, you know, uh, that's, that's changed college football dramatically over the last however many years that, that we went, went to that model. It has is, it is changed uh, college football. Um, so, again, uh, it is what it is. It, this is 2020, all these challenges, all these issues, all these changes, you got to embrace it. Uh, you got to evolve. That's, that's us as coaches and as players. Um, that's the administration. Uh, that's everybody. You know, we all we all have to evolve with it because uh, college football has probably changed more in the last ten years than probably any other point uh, in, in our history. John Stroh, WHVL. Mike Hallis, you're on deck. Hey, Coach. How are you? Good, John. What what I have noticed is when I talk less in the beginning, there's a lot more questions. Uh, so I, I probably need to talk more. No, no disrespect, John. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, uh, following just kind of playing off that que that last question, you're talking about the changes and the way college football has evolved. When, when you look at when you look at Iowa, uh, you know what does it kind of say about about Iowa? Uh, Iowa, when we're at a time in college football when everybody's you know embracing the spread. I mean, even Alabama has spread concepts now, you, and they they've stayed they've stayed true to what they have done throughout time with fullbacks, tight ends running the ball, playing great defense behind it. Um, and also, too, can you break down their defense a little bit? Yeah, what, what I would say to you, to, to you first of all is um, I think in essence you are correct. Um, they, they still have a fullback. They still um, you know, try to run the ball and be physical, and they're built up front. Um, but they also have a lot of spread concepts now as well. So it is, it's not the same Iowa, um, you know, uh, 
really, you know, since I've been in this conference, it's not the same Iowa that it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, do they still have a fullback? Yes. Do they still, you know, um, you know, try to set everything up through the run and play a physical style of football? Yes. Uh, all, all those things are accurate, but but they're running a lot. Uh, more spread concepts. They're 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 operating from the gun a lot more. Um, so they've evolved, in, in my opinion. And then defensively, you know they they've they've done a really good job. Um, you know they've had such consistency uh, on their staff, starting with the head coach all the way down. Uh, same thing with the defensive coordinator. Uh, they do a great job of making you earn everything. Uh, play a lot of zone coverages, have a lot of eyes uh, on the quarterback, which I think has been a big part uh, of their ability to lead the country in interceptions, I think, since 2017. Uh, I would say that they base out of a, a quarters philosophy, whether it's quarters, whether it's quarter, quarter, half, uh, on the back end. They're always one of the bigger fronts um, that, that we play. They're you know, obviously over 300 pounds, typically a D-tackle, and have length, usually 6'4 or taller. And then same thing at defensive end. Um, you know, uh, they're usually 270, uh, which are usually the, you know, on the bigger side of the defensive ends that, that we face. Uh, and they usually have tremendous length. They're still long this year, not as long as they've been in the past, like the 6'6", six, 6'7 six, six, guys that they've had. Uh, they're stout and physical at the linebacker position, um, and they blitz enough to, to keep you honest and create um, situations where your five individual blocks uh, that all have to win uh, or you're going to give up pressures to the quarterbacks. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing. They, they make you earn it, and they've created turnovers. And uh, I think they can spend a lot of their time because they don't change a whole lot on defense. Now, I, I would say that. You know, I would actually say where they've kept their their uh, you know their mentality almost completely intact is on, on the defensive side of the ball, and uh, what what they're able to do is this is who we are and this is what we play, and now we can spend all our time on learning what our opponent does and how they're going to try to attack us, and then the subtle tweaks that we have to uh, emphasize that week to stop them. Mike Hallis, Cedar Rapids Gazette. Nate Bauer, you're on deck. Good afternoon, James. Um, you, you've sort of answered this question partially, at least earlier in this, but uh, the fragility of college football programs, it's not just, I mean, in terms of wins and losses, it's not just you. It's within your division. You mentioned the rankings. You mentioned the Big Ten standings. What, what, how, just how fragile are college football teams? Well, I, I don't know about you know that the way you you described it, but but what I would say is, you know, you have uh, a group of programs that are battling like crazy to take that next step, and um, that is that is probably more challenging than than it's ever been, um, you know. And again, I think the focus and the emphasis. Uh, the focus on and the emphasis. Um, you know, you look at what we've been able to do the, the previous four years, um, but but then also you, you couple that with the expectations and, and the standards. Um, you know, but college football has changed. It's it's changed dramatically. Expectations have changed. Uh, you know, resources have changed. Facilities have changed. Um, and I, I think to your point. You know, this year I think is is you know probably magnifies it for for probably reasons outside of what you're discussing. Um, but I think a lot of it is is just based on who the school is, uh, kind of where they're at, what their history and traditions are, um, and and how they view uh, where they want to be. Um, specifically, when you talk about the college football playoffs um, and and how that all plays out. You know, it's 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 really interesting dynamic uh, that that we've that we've created. It's made it's made college football really exciting uh, in the playoff, and I think this is why there's been a lot of discussions about expanding it. But it's also had a a major impact on on the bowls. It's had a major impact on bowls, and it's had a uh, major impact on on regular seasons. 
Last two questions. Nate Bauer, Blue White Illustrated. Tyler Donahue, you're on deck. There we go. Hey, James. How are you? Good, Nate. How are you? Good. Um, I, I apologize. This is kind of a hypothetical, but in a, in a non-COVID world, what would the development trajectory have been of the offensive line uh, under Phil um, just in normal circumstances? And then how, how did that change uh, under current circumstances? Yeah. So I, I think your point, you know, is, is, uh, you know, is a good one. Um, this would have been the year to have no coaching turnover. You know, uh, if, if you were fortunate to be one of those programs where you had little to no turnover, that is helpful. Um, the other thing is, you know, did you have spring ball or not? You know, did, did you have spring ball or not? That, that factors in. It's really interesting looking across college football, you know, who had spring ball, who didn't, not only nationally, but also in our own conference. And I think that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, I think the, the other point that, you know, is, is an important one as well, um, you know, is, is how was the season canceled? You know, um, you know, or excuse me, how, was, how did the season kind of play out? Was it postponed and you kept practicing or was it canceled and then restarted and the emotional roller coaster that, 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 that went with that? And did you decide to keep your players during that or did you send them home? Um, and, you know, I remember being on a Big Ten call with a bunch of coaches and said, well, if we were going to be coming back, I, I wouldn't have sent my guys home, you know, and, and they were all decisions that, that, that we had to, had to work through. But, yeah, I think when you have an offensive line coach and the techniques and the fundamentals are important at every position, but probably even more so at that position, uh, and you're and – you're, you really have a, a, a different offensive philosophy or a tweaked offensive philosophy and a different tweak in offensive line philosophy, uh, you, want, you want to get as much time you know, with those guys as you possibly can. You know, but, but once again, you know, it's, a, it's always a fine line because I want to answer your guys' questions, but I don't want to feel like it's coming off as an excuse because at the end of the day, it is what it is, and, and we got to make the most of it. Uh, but but yeah, there's there's no doubt you would have you would have liked Coach Troutwine to get his hands on those guys all spring, and 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 then in a traditional uh, training camp uh, would have been would have been very valuable. Tyler Donahue, lines two four seven. And, and and the other thing I would say just to add on that is is even when we did get our guys early on, uh, we weren't allowed to be in pads, and and you can only do so much. Uh, at certain positions without without the pads. And O-line is, is specifically one of those positions. Tyler? Good afternoon, James. So, yeah, here on this one. Hey, um, three Castro fields, uh, typically we're used to seeing him in the starting lineup. He appeared to be involved in pregame warm-up and in full uniform last week. Didn't see him on the field, though. Any kind of light you could shed on, on his status and, and why he wasn't uh, involved in the, the game last Saturday? Yeah, he was medically unavailable last week for us. Thank you. Yep. And, and you know, and, and again, as you guys know, um, you know, I don't get into specifics, but I also don't want you guys to think uh, that, you know, Tariq was suspended for any reason or, or thing like that. But uh, we were hoping to get a Saturday, you know, game time decision that we may have him available. And, uh, and it got close, but, but we weren't. We weren't. Thank you very much, Coach. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Everybody have a great day. Appreciate you guys being on.